Hello everyone, this is Pip. And this is Kiki. And today we're back playing Remember Eleven. Now, where we left off last time, the main girl character, Kokoro, had just woken up after the plane crash. But she was in the main guy's body for some reason. So, let's find out why. Yeah, that'd be pretty scary. Yep, that would be really weird. <laughs> <laughs> to me, who had lost all sense of time, the dream felt like it lasted forever, or was it just for a moment? There was no light. I couldn't see anything. I could only hear a pleasant, steady pulse, like an unborn child floating in the amniotic fluid, wrapped up in a calming and safe warmth. It felt as if all my sins had been forgiven. All the anxiety and horror within me melted and slowly diffused with, into the amniotic fluid, disappearing without a trace. I let my body go with the flow as I drowned in the ever-present warmth and lost myself in ecstasy. Here it felt like I was the only absolute and all-powerful existence. I was at the center of the universe. I didn't want to think about anything else anymore. I just wanted to stay like this forever. I didn't care if it was just a dream. Even if it was just a tra tranquil illusion, it was one which I preferred to that horrible reality. But a dream will never be more than a dream, which one must eventually awake from. And without any warning, that moment of awakening came violently. I was forcibly jabbed back into reality bursting out of the empty space, without enough time to give even a baby's first cry. I was born into a new world. Where is this? In front of me was a small square glass window. The open palm of my right hand was pressed tight against the glass. I lowered my palm from the window. A palm print remained clearly visible on its cloudy white surface. I wiped it off with my sleeve, and a familiar image appeared. Me. It's me. I felt dazed. My head was cloudy. However, I could clearly understand that the image reflected in that window pane was my own. It's the same face I've had for 20 years now. There's no way I could be mistaken. As soon as I realized that, the haze in my head immediately disappeared. I looked down, checked my clothes, looked at my palms, and stared at the backs of my hands for a few moments. The fingers of both my hands traced the counters of my face, felt the texture of my skin, and ran through my hair, checking its length on their, on their way through. It sprang up and down. There were dull pains in my neck and hip, but it wasn't all that bad compared to the pain I had felt before. I stretch my arms out as wide as I can. I take a series of deep breaths and start speaking out loud. I see, so it was all a dream. Even though it was just a dream, I somehow felt really happy to be back in my own body again. I cast another glance at my reflection, then turned my head. Ah! Before me were the figures of an unfamiliar man and woman. The words I had blurted in surprise hung in the silent air. I suddenly felt very awkward and gave a slight shrug. The source of the awkwardness was the words that had come out of my mouth earlier. I didn't stop to think that I might not be the only person in that room. Um, uh... Mumbling these meaningless, meaningless words... I tried fruitlessly to relieve the tension for the moment, while at the same time attempting to analyze the situation I found myself in. First of all, where am I? As I took a look around, I could see that everything, including the roof, the floor, and the walls, was made out of wood. From where I stood, I could see a double bunk bed to the right and a doorway to the left. Near the wall across the room stood a wooden table along with a few simple chairs made from chopped logs. 
By the wall beside me was a rustic stove made out of old oil barrels. I could hear a crackling sound, most probably produced by the red hot logs burning inside the stove. Cumulus clouds of white steam rose from the tin kettle placed upon the stove. Considering how large the double bunk was, the double bunk bed was, the floor of the room would have probably fit 12 tatami mat mats. It may have actually been one tatami larger, but the window embedded in the wall was so tiny, it made the room feel rather cramped. A mountain hut? I couldn't think of any other possibilities. I looked out the window to make sure. There was only the featureless, depthless darkness spread out as far as the eye could see. There wasn't anything that could provide me with a clue. It wasn't that I couldn't see anything. Snow. My eyes were searching the scenery for more clues, but all they could see was the powdery snow dancing violently in the frozen darkness like pompous grass in the wind. Crystals of ice decorated the edges of the window. These scant clues didn't give me any idea of where we were, but this was definitely no southern island paradise. Then it hit me. The cold. And it wasn't just your average cold. My body was freezing to its core, enough to make me want to hug the barrel stove beside me. Hey, what's wrong? The voice made me turn around. The man looked worried as he watched over me. You alright? I'm alright wasn't something I could honestly say. Being suddenly seized by this freezing cold with two completely unfamiliar people in front of me. Just who were these people? The man in front of me wore a hooded jacket. His short trimmed hair had casually fallen into disorder. There was a sparse amount of stubble growing around his mouth and chin, and his prominent cheekbones gave him a dauntless appearance. His body was in good shape. His figure was trim. That being said, by no means was he thin. The muscles on his shoulders and chest were toned to the degree that their encounters were visible through his clothes. If anyone asked me, I'd have to say that he had an extremely manly strong body. In contrast to this air of strength that his body gave off, his eyes seemed to be doing a poor job of hiding his overwhelming sadness. The woman was crouching in front of the stove. Wrapped up in many layers of blankets, like an empress in her robes, her hands grasped a steel cup. Her eyes were not on me, but staring aimlessly at the contents of the cup. However, it didn't seem as if she was avoiding eye contact intentionally. Her garments were covered by the blankets, so I couldn't tell what she was wearing underneath. I could only see her dark brown high heels. The shoes weren't well suited for a place like this. And her shoes weren't all that looked out of place. The woman, with her hair in an updo, gave off an air of calm sophistication. Would it be an exaggeration to say she was from high society? Surrounded by the drum stove, the tin kettle, and the assorted timber, her appearance was particularly conspicuous. The man looked as if he was in his mid-thirties, while the woman appeared to be in her late twenties. Of course, that was just my estimate. They could have been younger. Anyway, I thought it was clear that both of them were older than me. First off, I... Should we talk to the man or talk to the woman? Let's talk to the man. Okay. Try talking to the man. Um, excuse me. Where are we? Who are you? Let's say who they are. Who are you? Hey, hey, have you forgotten about me already? He folded his arms, appearing frustrated. Didn't I tell you my name just now? Just now? What did he mean? I waited for him to continue. 
Are you sure you're feeling okay? What do you mean? No, uh, how should I say this? What I'm about to say may be a bit rude, but you... He raised one of his eyebrows, drawing my eye momentarily before continuing. You're acting kind of strange. Huh? Don't be mad, okay? A while ago, you were saying all kinds of weird things. All of a sudden, you started spouting nonsense, acting violently, screaming, and pausing for a long time while speaking. And now you're all gentle and everything. Well, with the shock from what happened, it wouldn't be surprising if you suffered a decent amount of mental damage, but... A shock? Yeah. From the airplane crash. Crash. Did I already forget what happened up until now? Reality and dreams are completely mixed up in my head as I tried hard to make sense of things. So that means the building and the people I saw before must have been all part of a dream. Then the crash. What happened to the other passengers? Was Uni saved? Although I couldn't be sure and felt a tinge of uneasiness, for some reason I wasn't really all that worried. Though I was still in a rather strange state of mind, I was definitely much calmer than the me in that dream. It was a mysterious feeling of confidence in me. The feeling that Uni was definitely alive somewhere. So it's as I thought. You don't remember the crash, do you? No, I don't think it's that. I remember it, everything. I replied immediately. Surprised, he tilted his head. You do remember? Really? Yes. But earlier you... Huh? Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Anyway, have a seat. Do you want me to get you something warm to drink? You were unconscious for a long time. Your throat is probably dry. He went over to the table and picked up his steel cup. With one hand, he gestured for me to take a seat. I passed behind the woman who was wrapped up in the blankets and sat down at the table with my back to the wall. Um, just what exactly did you mean? What did I mean about what? The man stood near the stove. He grabbed the tin kettle and poured some hot water into the cup. Uh, you said that I was acting oddly, didn't you? Yeah, I said that. It's the truth, after all. That's not quite what I mean. I'd like to know if there was any reason for it. A reason, huh? I can try to explain, but first of all, drink up. He placed the cup in front of me. I took a peek inside the cup and saw a reddish-orange liquid swaying lazily within. What is this? It's chamomile tea. I found it down in the storeroom, though, so I can't guarantee it'll be fresh. He glanced briefly at a corner of the room. There was an open rectangular latch. The hole was right next to the door. There was a ladder there. I couldn't see inside from here, but that was most likely the storeroom right below us. Chamomile has a tranquilizing effect. I see, so in other words, it'll calm me down? Well, something like that. I wasn't particularly agitated or excited at anything, but it was true that my throat was dry, so there was no reason to refuse the offer. Just as I had suggest as he had suggested, I brought the cup to my lips. Hot 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 but it's kind of good. A refreshingly gentle aroma similar to that of a green apple tickled my nose. The hot liquid made its way down my throat, gently warming me to the core of my body. I'm alive again would be the expression that described the way I felt best. That's good. Hmm? 
That smile of yours. It's the first time I've seen you smile. Now that he mentioned it, my face did feel like it was smiling. It was a little embarrassing. The steam rising from the cup slipped into my nose as I started talking. I'm sorry, but can I ask you one more question? Your name? You said you had just told me a while ago, but... He sat down on the table across from me. His mouth was open and he was laughing. Just what is so funny exactly? I didn't quite understand why he was laughing, but I didn't really mind it, as his laugh didn't seem the least bit ill-intentioned. I guess it's no surprise, all things considered. It's actually pretty amazing that we're having somewhat of a normal conversation like this. From his jacket pocket, he took out a creased and crumpled pack of cigarettes, along with a silver lighter. He tapped the cigarette out of the pack and placed it in his mouth. He handed the lighter incredibly naturally, snapping it open with ease. After the crisp, metallic sound faded, a red flame softly flickered into being, carrying the flame close to the tip of the cigarette. Phew. He exhaled in a puff of purple smoke. Yamagi Seiji. Nice to meet you. He placed the cigarette in his left hand and extended the other to me in greeting. I gladly shook it. His palm was so thick and rugged, it was as if it was made out of rock. And then... Suddenly, a loud noise. Acting on instinct, I pulled my hand back defensively. Hey, what happened? Are you alright? The man who had int introduced himself as Yamagi shouted into the corner of the room. There in the corner was a square hole I had seen just a few mo moments ago. Yeah, I'm alright. My hand just slipped a little, that's all. A voice could be heard coming from inside the hole. A familiar voice. It couldn't be. I shot up from my seat. What's the matter? Are you having another one of your episodes? I didn't have any time to answer. Before I could even think, my body had sprung into action. Clinging to the ladder, I glided down along it and descended to the basement. Uni! My premonition had been right, as I'd thought Uni was alive. He looked at me vacantly. Dozens of logs for the stove were scattered at his feet. What's wrong? He asked with a surprisingly calm face. I, sl I slowly moved toward him. I stopped in front of him. Standing stiff as a rod, he looked up at me. Kokoron? Are you Kokoron? His pupils widened as he blinked, muttering those words. Uni? You remembered me? Of course I do. There's no way I could ever forget. Filled with joy, I embraced him tightly without a second thought. Wait! Huh? They might break like this. Saying that, Uni slowly removed his glasses. He placed his glasses on the shelf, and then... Cochran! Suddenly, with a voice as lovely as a girl's, he leaped into my arms. I missed you. I miss you so much, Kokoron. Uni aimlessly groped at my back. He rubbed his face against me, snuffling like a spoiled child. I cradled him closely in return. With all the strength in my arms, I squeezed him tighter and tighter. This is the second time I've been reunited with this boy. But unlike the uni from my dream, this one 
wasn't cold-hearted at all. Uni had recognized me as myself. He greeted me as myself and confirmed me as myself. Just that was enough to make me feel very happy. Oh, come on! I have something that I need to say! What is it? Thank you for saving me. Ah, uh, you don't have to thank me. I didn't do anything at all. Yes, I couldn't do anything at that time. I had only fastened his seatbelt and taken his hand in mine. If there was anyone to thank for our rescue, it could only be God. Rather than fate, it seemed more appropriate to call this a miracle from God. But still, thank you. I clung to Uni's body as though I'd never let him go. I put his head under my nose and filled my lungs with his scent. We're alive. The smell of his hair, the burning warmth of his skin. Alive, alive. Over and over again, I repeated it in my mind. I trembled in joy as I stood at, as, as I stood witness to this miracle. After a while, I realized that my cheeks were wet. The small drops clinging to my lips were warmer than the chamomile tea I had just drank. We stayed in our embryos for quite a while, long enough to lo lose track of time. Right then, my mind was completely void of the memories from my strange dream, with its grotesque script and frighteningly detailed scenery. But still, there was one thing bothering me. I wanted to know why Uni was here, or what Uni had said bothered me. So, what do those mean? Like, like she's saying, I want to know why Uni was here. Like, how he got there? Yeah. Or do we want to know, like, what something that Uni said bothered her? Which I'm guessing is... When he said, are you you again? Or do you remember me? You know what I mean? Yeah. So which one do you think? Um, let's do what Uni had said bothered me. I missed you. I missed you, Kokoran. The words that had come from Uni's lips. It was as though something felt out of place. A suspicious feeling of dissatisfaction stirred my mind. But even so, something as trifling as that didn't matter, matter much now. With the end of the hug nowhere in sight, the little doubt that had sprouted in the corner of my mind slowly faded away. I had forgotten everything, becoming intoxicated with his warmth as I continued to soak in the happiness of our reunion. I'm left-handed. When I use a pen, chopsticks, or scissors, I always hold them in my left hand. That's why I wear my watch on my non-dominant non right wrist. That's because if I wore it on my left wrist, it would interfere with a variety of things. Of course, it's on my right wrist even now. It was a wrist, a wrist watch I had fancied and bought just the other day. The analog dial indicated that it was 9.37. The inside of the room was enveloped by the sad cry of the wind wailing outside. Other than that, besides the lid of the kettle rattling, not a sound could be heard. Not a single person opened their mouths. The heavy silence persisted. The cup placed in front of me was already empty. The chamomile tea had truly warmed my body and calmed my heart. You don't pronounce the H. Oh. It's just chamomile. A chamomile? Okay, I'm sorry. Just letting you know. I'd also gotten used to the feeling of sitting on hard wooden logs. I put my back up against the wall and observed the others. Uni was sitting on the bunk bed, dangling his legs. His face showed boredom, but even like this, he was far more energetic 
than the uni from my dream. Yumogi had fixed his gaze on the window, observing the conditions outside. Smoke was slowly rising from the cigarette he held leisurely between his middle and index fingers. The woman, who was wrapped up in numerous blankets, hadn't moved an inch from her spot in front of the stove. She flicked a stray lock of hair behind her ear. There was a lovely elegance to her actions which, even though I was a woman, drew my eyes with its coquettish charm. Even after being thrown here in such a disordered state, she still took a great care in keeping herself proper, from the angle of her fingers to the tilt of her neck. There were four of us inside the cabin, including myself. There was also one thing that all four of us had in common, and that was that we were all unhurt. Of course, we could probably easily find one or two scratches or bruises on our bodies. However, no one had any serious injuries. Our bones were fine and all of our insides seemed to be in place. It's not like I asked anyone directly, but that much was obvious from just observing the people around me. I don't remember a single thing about the crash, but I do know that the shock from it had to be tremendous. Yet here we are, alive and well. As I thought about it all, I couldn't help but think of the word miracle as well. Miracle. What a wonder it was that we were all alive here like this. This room didn't have any electric light lighting. Only the light of the lantern served to illuminate the hopeless air around us. The flame within it wavered, causing the shadows in the room to dance and sway along with it. Somehow it was a very illusory scene. Enchanted by the dubious flicker of the flame, I began to lose sight of the boundary between reality and fantasy. In this silence con if this silence continued, I felt like I would once again be consumed by that bizarre dream world. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it is, so somebody say something. So resolved, I decided I decided to first. Talk to you, Moggy. Talk to Uni. Talk to the woman wrapped up in the blankets. Do you want to meet the woman now? Or do you want to just talk to one of the guys? I don't know, we can go ahead and talk to the woman. She hasn't said anything yet. Yeah. I tried speaking with the woman wrapped up in blankets. Um. Silence. Um, can you hear me? There was no reason she wouldn't be able to hear me. I was simply being ignored again. She had been so thoroughly ignoring me that it began to feel as if it, she was doing it out of some sort of hostility towards me. Did I do something to leave her with a bad impression of me, perhaps? No, I don't remember it doing anything like that. I just met her recently, and we hadn't even exchanged a single word. Or, it was possible she was just that kind of person to begin with. It might be that she wasn't really a people person, or something like that. With nothing else to do, I started to I started talking to Yamogi. That was a nice talk with her. <laughs> She's really a really nice person. Yep. Hey, Yamogi-san. Hmm? The four of us are the only ones here, right? Yeah, I think so. Why do you ask? Then, um, the other passengers. Yamagi looked out the window and took a long drag on the cigarette. Slowly letting the smoke out, he wiped the white cloudy window. That's right. Now that you mention it, I've yet to speak with you about it, Yukido-san. Yukido? Did I hear him wrong? An unfamiliar name suddenly entered my ears. Yumagi left the window and made his way to the center of the room. He 
He took a square box from the shelf and beside the bed. You want some more tea? This might take a while. He prepared the chamomile tea while holding a cigarette between his lips. He poured us some tea. He put out a cigarette in the ashtray he's sitting on the table and then sat down in front of me. Well then, where should I start? How far back can you remember, you good little son? I'm pretty sure I can recall you saying, I remember everything about the crash. Again? Again, he uses a name I've never heard before. What's wrong? Why are you frowning like that? I strained my posture and began to talk, looking intently at him. Before we get into that, can I ask you something? What is it? Who's this? You can go. Who oh, you say? But that's your name. I was astonished. Sighing deeply, I could feel myself starting to shake. Why? Why were things like this happening one after another? I can't exactly say why I was angry, but there was no way I was just be just going to bite my tongue. I raised my voice in protest. My name is is Fuyukawa Kokuro, okay? Really, I wonder how many times I'd have to repeat myself like this. I'm tired of it already. Although, the other times I said that phrase had been inside the dream. Eh? Fuyukawa Kokoro? That's right, Fuyukawa Kokoro. Should I show you my student ID card? Or would my driver's <clears throat> license please you better? For that matter, how about we go down to the local ward office right now so you can see an official copy of my family registry? No, sorry. It seems I've somehow made you angry. But originally, the one who brought up the name Yukudo was you, so... Yumagi hesitated to speak. His gaze wavered around the room as he rubbed the stubble on his chin. Well, whatever. It's probably true if you say so. Not probably. It is true. Fine, fine, I got it already. Your name is Fuyukawa Kokoro, right? Yes. I clearly asserted. And then... Wait. Just wait a second. The woman, who had presently preserved her silence until now, finally opens her mouth. Throwing off her blankets, she delicately stands up and walks purposefully toward me. You, just what is your deal? She slams both of her hands on the table. Bending forward, she brings her face up to mine. Her entire body gives off a ghastly aura, filling me with dread. My name is Foikawa Kokoro. And why did you say it was Yukado before? I don't know what she's angry about, but the dreadful expression on her face leaves me unable to reply. Answer me. You just, what are you plotting? Plotting. Now this was a word I remember hearing. Somehow it feels almost like a reenactment of my dream. Saying I'm Fuyukawa Kokoro and having somebody get angry because of that, it did rather resemble the dream. Then was that dream supposed to be some kind of a premonition? Hey, you listening? I'm talking to you. I'm listening, really. <laughs> Your attitude sure has changed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your attitude sure has changed from before, hasn't it? Before, before, before. When they say before, just what do these people mean? Well, I'll ask you one more time. Why did you say something so stupid? Something so stupid? Don't pretend like you don't know. Obviously, 
when you're trying to trick us by saying you were Yukato Satoru. What, who is that person? Stop it with the lousy act already. Act, act, act. Even though I'm not acting. Now, now, calm down, Meizumi. You're scaring Fuyukawa-san. Mm -hmm. What do you just say? Meizumi? You just called me Meizumi, didn't you? Stop addressing me as if I were your pal. Just who do you think you are? Well then, what should I call you? Lin Chan, maybe? Making fun of me, you unshaven old bastard. Being referred to with Chan is the thing I hate most in this world. Then, what's the thing you hate the second most? People. I don't know, calling me by my last name with no honorifics at all. Then, what would number three be? Number three is, let's see. Being called by the wrong name, maybe? Like being called Suzu instead of Lin? Or being called Kairu instead of Mayazumi? Now that you mention it, one time I got a direct mail address to someone named Tombi, written the same as Black Kite. Why did it arrive at my house? I wish people wouldn't suddenly decide that I'm some kind of a bird of prey. Uh, did you hear that? Tombi, she said. It sure suit you to be reborn as a falcon, wouldn't it? Shut up. Brat's like you should get lost, brat. Whoa, what's wrong with you? I was just joking around. What? Got a problem? Ha! This is why grannies are trouble. Yuni had probably gotten angry as he deliberately muttered the phrase at a volume just loud enough for it to be heard. G -g Granny? Where'd you get off calling a lovely young maiden of 23 a granny? A granny? I called you a granny because you are a granny, you senile old hag. <laughs> you bastard! Look, you've got crow's feet all around your eyes, don't you? Tobolin Chan. You damn brat, you wanna go, huh? Do you? As if. Who'd wanna start a fight with an old lady like you? Uh, uh, now you've done it. I wonder if I should just roll you up in a mat and throw you outside. Try it if you can, you permission gobbling old hag. You got it, you four eyed sea anemone. Come on, cut it out, you two. Yumohi, sick of watching their back and forth, decided to interfere and push the two apart. You haven't forgotten where we are, have you? What are you gonna do if you waste all your strength on a pointless squabble like this? But... No buts. If you carry on with this nonsense, you'll be sleeping in the storeroom. Are we clear? Yumagi lectured them in a surprisingly dignified tone. The two exchanged sharp glares, but restrained themselves from taking any further actions. Even those two couldn't do anything with Yumagi standing like a mountain between them. Neither really backing down, Uni and the woman both looked away and returned to their respective territories. Huh, really now? Yumagi sighed as he placed his hand on his hip. Before we knew it, he had lost track of our conversation, and the target of the woman's anger had completely changed. I was certainly glad to have gotten out of further questioning, but... Anyway, I was able to at least establish the woman's name. Mayazumi Lin... Like a cat about to flee after a, fly, a fight, she opened her mouth to let out a last parting complaint. Her personality was almost the complete opposite 
of what I had imagined it would be based on her mature looks and graceful bearing. The image of her I had in my mind just a few moments earlier had been thoroughly revised. The woman had a rude, harsh, and unlimited personality. By the way, my Izumi's questioning, though it had been brief, had implanted a lingering feeling of uneasiness in the corner of my mind. It's about Yukido Satoru. Why was I mistaken for this Yukido person, whom I've never met before and know nothing about? First of all, just who is Yukido Satoru? That and the words both Yumagi and Maizumi had said bother me. A while ago, you were saying all kinds of weird things. Why did you say it was Yukido before? Didn't I tell you my name just now? <laughs> Your attitude sure has changed from before, hasn't it? Before. Replaying it all in my head, I finally arrived at an answer. Based on what they had said, only one conclusion could be reached. No, something like that just wasn't possible. I denied my own thoughts immediately. It was something that I couldn't believe, that I didn't want to believe. The conclusion I had reached was simply too unreal to accept. That's why I turned away from it. I didn't want to think about it any further. I am me, Foyakawa Kokoro. I'm no one else but me. Struggling to suppress my wild thoughts, I tried to convince myself of this. It was around 10 o'clock p.m. A large heap of blankets in the hand, my Izumi climbed up onto the top bunk. Now there was a woman lying with her back towards us in more than ways than one. The kind of person that would stay in bed just to show everyone how much she detested their company. I wasn't sure if she was really sleeping or not. She may have just had her eyes closed. In any case, without so much as a sorry or a good night, this woman shut herself away in her own little world. Naturally, there wasn't anyone who bothered to ask her what she was up to. To tell the truth, I myself was a little relieved that the troublesome one had decided to settle down. Well then, shall we begin? As if prudently choosing this timing, Yumagi quietly opened his mouth. There's something I'd like to say before I begin. Please, don't lose heart. There's still hope. He carefully chose his words as he continued solemnly. Flight HAL-18, that was the name of the small passenger aircraft we boarded. The plane was carrying a total of 31 passengers and crew members of a non-stop journey to Wakani, one of the chain of islands in the north of Japan. If flight conditions were favorable, we should have arrived at the airport at 5 p.m., but January 11th, 2011, 4.08 p.m. Flight HAL-18 crashed deep in the snowy mountains. I, who had regained consciousness after being thrown out of the plane... Oh, you think it's you me? I guess it's probably him somewhere, huh? Um. I, who had regained consciousness after being thrown out of the plane, began my search and rescue efforts for survivors. A snowstorm was raging all around. Sunset was strong near, and I could barely see past my nose. Still, I didn't give up. The fact that I was all right meant that there had to be other survivors as well, I thought. It was not a feeling of obligation or a sense of justice which kept me going. I was spurred on by some unexplicable instinct. Before long, I found two women among the scattered rubble. Meizumi Lin and Yu. Having lost consciousness from the shock of the crash, you were lying beneath the caved-in ceiling, your head hanging limp. 
Even when I shook you by the shoulders and slapped your cheek, you showed no sign of coming to. Mayuzumi, on the other hand, was conscious. She stood up on her own, mumbling something deliriously, and started aimlessly walking into the downpour of snow on her unsteady feet. The girl had, had most likely lost at least some of her sanity to the shock of the crash. Even when I called for her to stop, my voice didn't seem to reach her ears. Somehow, I was able to catch her, and my very next thought was that I should find some shelter from the wind. What I found was a section of the airframe, severed at the front and back. The outer wall burned black, unshapely, exposed framework that resembled the decaying corpse of a monster. Pulling Meizumi by the hand and carrying you over my shoulder, I entered the carcass, seeking ref refuge. Inside a foul stench filled the air. I suddenly realized that the smell was that of burning meat. <laughs> so yummy. There were chunks of charred flesh stuck firmly to the seats, yeah. which had been fixed to the floor. Dead bodies were still seated with their heads against the back of the seats in front of them. Some of the bodies were missing everything from the seatbelt down. <laughs> there were blood stains, scraps of flesh, and entrails splattered against the window. There was one corpse that seemed comparatively unharmed, but it stayed motionless, frozen solid like a plaster sculpture. The only word that could describe the disaster scene was hell. Having taken it all in, Meizumi looked absent-minded and dazed. You were still unconscious, so you didn't react at all. However, a single sigh escaped your lips, which made me believe you'd surely get better with time. Your body temperature, however, was nearly that of a corpse. That made sense. You were wearing the same clothes you boarded the plane in. Of course you weren't the only you weren't the only one with problem with this problem. Miyazumi was the same. She was wearing a suit and high heels, and her legs were only covered with a thin pair of stockings. Left like that, the two of you would have surely died. With this in mind, I looked around I looked through the melted baggage compartments of the ceiling of the plane in hopes of finding something useful among the luggage. I grabbed the bags that looked like they might have something helpful inside and pulled them down. I found a down jacket and a fur coat, a wool sweater, a muffler, and some gloves. I got together as many clothes like that that I could find and dressed you two in them. By the time I had finished, the sun had disappeared behind the horizon. With the light from the moon and the stars eaten up by the clouds and the snow, near perfect darkness enveloped us. I found a flashlight near the flight attendant's seat. I turned it on and a streak of light pierced the darkness. There were only two things to be done next. First, I had to make a shelter by closing off the open ends of the store show on airflow. Second, I had to find some means of communication to send out a distress signal. I, I didn't spare a thought for anything else. There might have been some there might have been people still alive somewhere in the snow field. However, the small pieces of wreckage had been scattered over a large area, which would have made further searching nearly impossible. And what about making our way down the mountain? In this state of affairs, that took precedence over anything else. As a mountaineer, I knew how terrifying and treacherous the snowy mountains could be. To start marching randomly inside a snowstorm is reckless at best. I didn't have a clue as to where we were. I didn't even know which way it was to the base, so I couldn't even think about descending the mountain. Our options were very limited. We spent all night in Biovag, with nothing else to do but wait for the weather conditions to improve. If they caught better, a military or a rescue helicopter would have no trouble finding us. Of course, that'd be pointless if the three of us lost our lives before they arrived. That's why, to live, that was the highest priority for us. I immediately got to work. 
I used the gathered luggage and blankets and such to stuff up the gaping holes in the airframe. The day had come to an end and the temperature started falling. It felt like it soon get so cold that your breathing would freeze instantly. I had lost all feeling in my fingers, yet I continued working silently. However, as I was covering up one of the holes, I noticed something. Mayazumi was gone. No matter where I looked, she was nowhere to be seen. I rushed outside. Thick snowflakes began to fall and cling to me in layers, as if they had been eagerly waiting for the chance. I bent double to avoid this attack, pulling my hood close over my eyes and began searching in the darkness. The piled up snow beneath my feet was immeasurably deep, but thanks to that, I could see the trail broken by Mayuzumi's rustling through. With the torch in hand, I turned to find more traces. I could barely see a thing. In the middle of a snowstorm at night, the light of a pocket flashlight was almost useless. And if I tried calling out at the top of my lungs, the roaring of the wind would effortlessly drown out my voice. I couldn't waste another moment if I wanted to find her, as the traces that she had left behind were quickly being filled with snow. I jumped into the snow. My body began to move without a second thought. I pushed on, parting the fallen snow before me. Blinded by a myriad of snowflakes, I single-mindedly continued to pursue her trail. After marching on for about ten minutes, I finally caught a glimpse of her. She had collapsed face down in the middle of a large snowfield. I had no idea why she would do something so foolish. Losing her cool and giving in to the panic, she may have thought, it doesn't matter where I go, I just need to get away. Anyway, she had made her way here and probably collapsed from exhaustion. I brought her ear close to my mouth, closer to her mouth. I could hear her breathing just barely. I quickly put her on my back and started making my way along the path I had made coming here. Even if it was only the body of a single white woman, trying to rustle through while carrying a person on my back was unthinkably difficult. Our path was hindered by the now hip deep snow. It had become virtually impossible to take another step forward. And when we stood still, the snow blowing up at us from the ground was mercilessly robbing us of our body heat. My limbs had become completely numb. My fingertips, if I could feel them, would probably feel like pieces of thick, solid wire. We pushed on and on, but the surrounding landscape didn't show any signs of change. No matter where we went, the darkness spread endlessly through the space around us like a curse. Before long, I lost sight of the path. The markers I had left behind had become buried by the snow and were indiscernible. My legs had become completely stuck. I couldn't take a single step further. So this is it. I knelt down in the snow. I knew that this would happen from the moment I set out. If you walk out into a snowstorm, then it's only natural for you to lose your way. But even then, I never once thought of turning back. Why is that? It might have been that bringing back Meizumi was just an excuse, when in reality, I wanted to meet my end here. It's too late. Too late. No matter where I looked, the desolate, barren plain was dyed the color of death. This world ruled by despair and emptiness was rejecting my life, and the act of breathing was regarded by it as a sin. The sharp pain running through my entire body was a sure testament to that. With Meizumi still on my back, I collapsed in the middle of the snowfield. Sorry for the long wait. Now I can finally join you. Dad. Dad. Right then, I thought I heard a voice. A voice I'd heard so often, but now thought I'd never hear again. Dad, Dad. I knew it had to be an illusion. Faced with death, my consciousness was breaking down. It felt like it was a voice of a spirit come to haunt me. However, I couldn't help but try to confirm it. Having gathered the remainder of my strength, I strained my throat and raised my nearly frozen body to its unsteady feet. Junichi? Junichi, is that you? Dad, here, here. 
There's a mountain cave cave in here. I found it. When I snapped out of it, I saw a boy standing in front of me. It was the boy I happened to catch a glimpse up of on the plane. Follow me! Saying this, the boy started walking. I gave my head a good shake. It somehow brought my strained consciousness back into focus. The boy wasn't my son. That's how I was sure it wasn't just my delusion or some mysterious phantom, but a definite real entity with a solid shape and form. What are you standing around for? The mountain cabin is right over here. There, hurry up! I once again lifted me and zoomed me onto my shoulders. With the boy in front of me as a guide, I started walking forward. And then... Seven sixteen p.m. Three hours after the crash, we had finally reached this mountain cabin. It goes without saying that the boy who guided us, as, us here was Uni. If Uni hadn't come, then right about now, me, Azumi, and I would probably be peacefully enjoying our final sleep under that snow. You could certainly say that Uni was our savior. It's unfortunate that May Azumi, being unconscious at the time, still doesn't seem to understand this. So, that's pretty much everything that happened up until now. Did you get all that? With those words, Yamagi tried to finish off his long speech. But... Well, wait a second. Hmm? What about me? What happened to me after you left me there? Wanting to tie up all the loose ends, I asked him again. Yamagi smiled ever so slightly. Of course, we went back for you. Uni gave me a hand as well. We brought you back here from the shore and open airframe. Honestly speaking, it wasn't easy. It may seem pretty energetic. I may seem pretty energetic now, but back then, I was on the verge of collapsing myself. But then, how did you find the hole? You said you got lost, didn't you? Uni knew the way. Uni did? I turned toward Yuni. Behind Yumagi, Yuni was sitting in the spot where Meizumi had been camped out until shortly before. As his back is to me, I can't see his face. I didn't know whether or not he'd been listening to our conversation earlier. How did Yuni know where the airframe was? He had a compass on him. A compass? As in the magnet that you use to tell direction? Yeah. Yuni, who had been thrown out of the plane, had immediately started walking in a straight line, away from the crash site, using his compass. I think it was a sound judgment, all things considered, seeing as how there was no place that would have sheltered him from the wind, and it wasn't a situation where help would arrive if he stayed still and waited. That's why he began walking. Of course, he didn't just wander around, Probably confirming the position of his destination and the number of steps, he started walking in the snowstorm. If he had found nothing in the direction he was headed, heading, he could simply go back to where he started. He sure is something. His judgment isn't like that of an 11 year old old at all. Uni sold an, an admirable composure even more than that of a seasoned mountaineer like me. A weird feeling of suspicion, perhaps, started welling up inside me. I, find myself, I found myself unable to blindly admire Uni's efforts. Things like Uni conveniently having a compass and not losing his cool after the shock of the crash. If you put it all together, you couldn't help but think there was something unusual going on. Well, anyway, searching around like that, Uni co coincidentally discovered this shelter cabin. What's important is that he remembered the direction that he walked in, along with the number of steps he took to arrive here. And that's why we... You were able to find the crash site where I'd been left behind, is that it? Is something bothering you? No, not really. I said that, but in reality, innumerable things were still bothering me. In today's conversation, 
Nobody had mentioned even once how Yuni had managed to find Yamagi and Meizumi. Moreover, even if it were possible for Yuni to return to his own starting point, that didn't necessarily mean that I was easy to find again amongst the snow. Looking at the probability of all these occurrences, it seems like even the word miracle would be an understatement to describe all that had happened. It felt like a work of some invisible power, like we might have been led to this cabin inevitably. An invisible power. What it could be, I have no idea. I see. I murmured as I brought the cup closer to my lips. The chamomile tea inside had become cold by now. Uh, that's right. I forgot to say something important, didn't I? Once it hit me, I lowered my head. Wiping my lips and correcting my posture, I spoke. Thank you. Uh? I'm showing my gratitude. Thank you very much for saving me. Hey, cut it out. I'm no good with hot felt thanks and stuff. Besides, if you want to express your gratitude, shouldn't it be to him? Yamagi stuck out his thumb and pointed it toward Yuni, who was sitting be behind him. I stood up and went closer to Yuni. Yuni had curled up into a ball in front of the stove. The way he held his head made it difficult for me to see his face. I squatted down beside him and spoke. Yuni? Yuni? Yuni didn't reply. Leaning down, I lightly shook him by the shoulder. I took a peek at his face. Crouched in place, Yuni was breathing evenly in his sleep. Thank you, Yuni, I said in a soft voice. In reality, I felt like I wanted to hug him from behind and roll around with him on the floor. I was overwhelmed with a feeling of gratitude, one that could not be conveyed by thousands or even tens of thousands of words. That we're alive right now is all thanks to them, Yuni and Yamagi. I gently embraced Yuni's body and laid him down on the bottom bunk. I placed several blankets on top of him, and then a few more for a good measure. Uni tossed a bit in his sleep as he mumbled something. I quietly removed his glasses. Now then. Holding Uni's glasses in my hand, I wander aimlessly around the cabin. The emotions welling up inside me, seeking an outlet, are driving me to walk around in circles. This is a passionate feeling of gratitude, and I need to convey it some, to someone, somehow. But who? Well, of course. Yamagi-san? With an almost indecent cry, I jumped onto Yamagi's back without warning. Ah. Our limbs entangling, we tumbled, rolling around on the floor. Yamagi-san! Yamagi-san! Hey, come on! What's gotten into you? Stop it, Fuyukawa! Stop it! Stop! Please! Come on! Stop! I won't stop! I won't stop! Just what are you trying to do? What got into you? What? What is the meaning of this? There is no meaning. I'm just expressing my feelings. Expressing your feelings? Hey, now. Don't be hasty, Fuyukawa. We're not in that kind of relationship yet, you know? <laughs> Even tough guys like me can't take this kind of wear and tear. Oh, cut it out. Roll, 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 roll. Hug, 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 hug. My expression and my feelings continued for a while afterward. Alright, looks like this is a good stopping point. Yeah, he was a nice guy to save him. Yeah, but it was really weird, like... On how they got to the cabin? Well, yeah, uni, the whole uni thing is really yeah. weird, so... Can't wait to see what happens. We will have to find out next time. 
thank you everybody for watching and if you like this video make sure you give it a like or comment and subscribe to us yeah thanks for watching bye see ya